This is ArmyCast, episode 250 from Monday, January 30th, 2012. Precision. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos. We help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Doing very well, very cold. A little sick, so people can hear it in my voice. I'm a little, a little nasally today, so I apologize. It should be going away. Um, but, uh, but now you had a couple of things that we wanted to, to talk about yes. today. Uh, one is you wanted people to remind people about the survey that we're running. Right. So every couple of years, we do a general listener survey to find out how we're impacting you, what you want to learn, and exactly why you come and spend spare time listening to the two of us talk astronomy. So if you can spend a few months, spend a few minutes answering few some questions, <laughs> spend yeah. a few minutes, yeah. you can spend a few minutes asking answering some survey questions for us. The survey is at astrosphere.org slash surveys slash astronomy cast slash we're just going to put all the links up for you. Um, I'll be tweeting that in just a minute and it will be in our show notes for this episode. Yeah, and um, I'm sure if you go to ask to, where is it, to astronomy cast, I'm sure there'll be a link to the survey there. Yes. Okay, cool. And then the other thing we want to remind everyone is now that it's 2012 and that the uh, world is ending, uh, we're going to be on a cruise at the end of the year to celebrate the end of the world. Not. So, um, <laughs> you know, at the very moment that the Mayans predicted, uh, I guess the Mayans ran out of calendar space, uh, we will be cruising around the uh, coast of Mexico talking about astronomy and uh, celebrating the continuation of the world with all of our other skeptical friends. So... There's going to be, uh, David Brin's going to be on this cruise. Uh, there's going to be astronauts. It's going to be awesome. So, uh, and we're going to be there. And we're going to be so, doing probably live recordings of Astronomy Cast, and you can hang out with us. Play shuffle board. And all the details are at astrosphere.org again. And if you sign up, and when you talk to the travel agency, tell them you're part of the Astronomy Cast group. We'll have special freebies and special events just for you on the cruise ship. Yeah, and then we want to know sort of how many people are, are coming for us so we can sort of accommodate that. So, yeah. awesome. And I know it's a limited number of space, so this is one of those things we'll, we'll keep nagging you until <clears throat> all the spaces are gone, and then we won't talk about it anymore. All right, and okay, and so then one last little piece of work. Uh, so once again, we're recording this episode of Astronomy Cast as a live Google Plus Hangout. We record these every Monday at noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, uh, 8 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. Uh, that's all the time zones I can think of. Uh, so if you want to join us live, we try to sort of get an announcement ahead of time, and then you can watch the video. You can um, <clears throat> and participate, ask questions, uh, jump in the hangout with us, and uh, yeah, and it's sort of a, the next level of interaction. And big thanks to Google for letting us use this technology. It's awesome. All right, well, that's it. Let's get, let's get rolling. Okay. All right, so accuracy, precision, and reproducibility. These are the foundations of science that make our progress possible. But how do these play into a scientist's daily activities? And just how precise can we get with our measurements? Man, are we going to talk about scientific notation? No. No? Okay. No. <laughs> that's, that stuff is that's like my, the bane of my, uh, of my university existence. <laughs> but... Um, Right, so, so then let's talk about that. I mean, precision, so, so where, you know, you proposed this topic this week, and I wanted to sort of get a sense of where you wanted to go with this. Well, right now we, we live in a world where lots of different things are getting discussed about in terms of is it real. There's the um, neutrinos travel faster than the speed of light issue. There's dark energy, dark the matter. Higgs There's boson. the Higgs boson. And the question that people should be asking is, at what level can I believe the things that I'm hearing are true? And this plays out on so many different things. It plays out also on at what point do you believe a Kepler detection of a planet is real? Um, at what point do you believe the detection of a distant galaxy isn't just a fluke of your detector on a given day? So as we're trying to sort out all of these different things, there's lots of vocabulary that comes into play and lots of ideas that come into play that we don't generally have to deal with in everyday life. So I wanted to spend an episode getting into things like, well, what is the difference between precision and accuracy? What do you mean you can have a highly precise result that means absolutely nothing? Um, so this is, this is where I wanted to go. So then, I guess, how would you say that scientists define that precision? Like, where... 
How are you going to measure that? So we deal with two basic variables. One is how precise is your measurement? And that basically says, if I take a measurement and I repeat it over and over and over and over, the values are either tightly bundled together or if it's not a precise result, they're spread out a lot. So the example we use when we're teaching is you're throwing darts. If you're a highly precise dart thrower, all of your darts are going to land within half an inch of each other. If you're an unprecise dart thrower, all of your darts are going to land spread out over two, three meters maybe on the wall. You're taking up the whole wall with your five darts. So precision is how closely spaced are all of your results. And so if you're like doing some kind of scientific research and you're looking for some expected outcome, you're going to want the expected outcome to be precise. Otherwise, it's just going to be random noise. Exactly. And at a certain level, we, we always start off with a fair amount of noise in our results. As people have worked on trying to define the expansion rate of the universe, they have gone from plus or minus a few hundred kilometers per second in the early years of trying to make these measurements to plus or minus a few kilometers per second. Um, so over time, we get our results closer and closer. The error bars on the age of the universe have gotten smaller and smaller you always start off with less precise results and get better and more refined as you go. But precision and accuracy aren't the same thing. And this is one of the things that we have to worry about when we start looking at things like the neutrinos moving faster than the speed of light problem. So I guess in that case, you know, they were very precise in that all of the neutrinos that they detected were moving faster than the speed of light within a very close range. You know, they threw all those darts and they all landed very close to each other. But the question now is, are those results accurate? Exactly. So you can imagine the, the person who throws all of their darts and they all land within an inch of each other in the very last circle of the dartboard. So they have very precise results that are in entirely the wrong place. And this is one wrong of those problems. That, <laughs> yeah. Right. And so this is the type of thing that can come down to well, I don't know what it would come down, down to with a dart thrower, but there's been plenty of experiments that have been done where uh, you don't realize your meter stick is missing the last three millimeters of the meter stick. You don't realize your equipment is misaligned by one degree. Right, so you could have something that's p causing noise in your experiment in a very predictable, very, uh, you know, it, it's always doing the same thing and it's always wrong by the exact same amount. It, it's a systematic offset. Yeah. Um, people who fire guns deal with this when their sights are off. Or if you're playing a video game, you may realize, crud, I always need to click up and to the left three pixels in order to actually hit the thing correctly. So there's systematic offsets that if you don't know what they are, you can't believe any of your results. And are there many situations where it's those systematic offsets? that people didn't realize they were happening and, and then they thought they had accuracy and precision? Well, they keep cropping up throughout all of history. Most people, I think, believe that the neutrinos moving faster than light are actually going to turn out to be some systematic problem with either not understanding the way the, the Earth is stretching, not understanding the distances, not understanding the GR involved and the corrections needed to match two clocks in two locations. And, and so we just look back and we keep finding small things like this. I, I know there have been cases of, oh crud, we forgot to take into account the fact that the Milky Way is moving. Um, those sorts of little things add up when you're trying to figure out things on cosmic scales or even local scales. So it's, it's the type of thing that we figure it out fast enough that there aren't too many glaring mistakes. I, I can think of a good example. Like, remember how you know Newton made his predictions about the movement of Mercury, and right. eventually telescopes got better and better and better, and scientists were able to calculate the position of Mercury with great precision, and yet it was always wrong. And it, and that matching his ex, matching his theories, right? And and that wasn't so much a, an error in measurement as an error in understanding. Um, right in so, prediction, yeah. Yeah, we we have to worry about two different things. It's, it's the systematic offsets in our measuring, which is where we worry about the neutrinos. But sometimes we're just missing a term in our equations. And that doesn't so much go into to precision and accuracy as uh, we just missed a term in our theory. Now, so there's a, there was a really good example that's come up quite recently with, with the 
possible detection of the Higgs boson by the by CERN, uh, they sort of talked a lot in sort of you know was it sigma degrees of sigma like you know they How were many, yeah yeah, S yeah so this starts to get into noise theory anytime we make a measurement. Um, there's going to be some sort of inherent noise in it. There's going to be, um, if we're trying to detect light, there's just this constant steady stream of photons at, at all colors that are creating this noisy background. There's going to be um, just minor fluctuations when you try and make measurements with a ruler, measurements with a laser, measurements with any tool. And if the noise is truly random, what you should end up with is all of these different variables, um, all of the different ways that things can go wrong, if they're random, work out to form what's called a Gaussian distribution, a bell curve, a normal distribution, such that the majority of your measurements are going to be um, pretty close to the same value. And this means that if you take all of your points and you plot them, you'll end up with um, plus or minus 34.1% of your values, so 34.1% that are too high and 34.1% are too low. Those count as one sigma off of, off of accurate. So you end up with a curve where one sigma is plus or minus 34.1% of your values. Then you end up with another sigma is the term we use. I know, it's all quite confusing. So it's a bell curve. Go plus or minus 34.1%, and that's one sigma. Um, now, I know this is hard to understand. So for three sigma, in, instead of giving you the percentages that we're looking at, it's one in 370 of your values. So if you take a whole bunch of observations, one in 370 of them is going to fall three sigma away from your ac actual value. So once you start to get to that level of, wow, that probably shouldn't have happened, you start to think, maybe this is something other than the measurement I was trying for. Maybe that's something above the noise in my values. So with the Higgs boson, if you're looking in a chamber for a particle to randomly come out of the energy of what they're colliding in the detector, there's a random chance that something's just going to happen. And then there's the, you see it happening more often than random would predict. And if you see it happening at the 1 in 370 level, that's a three sigma detection. And didn't they, I mean, they said, or that maps over to something like a, what was it, a 99% yeah, so possibility? They, right, of it actually being real. Now, the thing with the Higgs boson detections is they haven't actually gotten up to three sigma yet. They're looking at, like, almost two sigma detections. And in reality, what we actually really hope for is a six sigma detection. This is where you have a one in 507 million chance of the thing occurring randomly. So once you start to get to something is that rare in random distribution, you start to say, huh. Maybe that's real. Or it, it was. Remember last week we were talking about the confirmation of uh, of the sort of multiverse theory, right? That you happen to right. exist in the universe where all the particles <laughs> are lining up at the wrong place. But but right. So you could. I mean, it's funny. That, I mean, phys If you go, if you got you know if I'm 99 percent right, then that's pretty right. But it's quite surprising. The physicists are, are so reserving of their judgment that they need a 99 point you know 999. I forget how many nines to be really comfortable with that, that they've, they've found the Higgs boson and they'll announce it. You know, and I think when physicists say we've discovered a particle, they are serious. Well, and, and the thing with the Higgs boson that I've, I've really enjoyed watching is they're not only doing one experiment over and over at a variety of different energies trying to prove that it exists with that one detector at that one set of energies but they actually have a whole variety of different experiments going on. And what's kind of awesome is through using the ATLAS experiment, the CMS experiment, the D0 group, um, all of these different experiments that all do very different things that are for an entirely different show. What they're doing is they're systematically with all of the experiments 
ruling out some energy levels. So they've pretty much completely ruled out everything at a higher energy than 128 giga electron volts per C squared, which is just a number, deal with it. Um, but with all of these experiments, they've ruled out that region. And with both ATLAS and CMF, CMS, they've managed to say there seems to be something going on between 115 and 127 giga electron volts per C squared. Again, just a set of numbers. But two different experiments using two different methodologies have come at the same range of, huh, there might be something here. Now the problem is the it might be something here is such a weak detection that it's hard to say it isn't just something random that's in the background noise of, well, what the universe is constantly doing. There's constantly particles coming in and out of existence. There's lots of stuff going on at every single moment, and it's hard to know. Are they just detecting the tail end of the universe or an actual detection of the Higgs boson? So is that an accuracy problem? Um, it's not an noise accuracy. coming in that's you know pushing everything in the wrong direction. So so accuracy and precision refer to your your data. Is it is are all of your data coming in at the same energy level? So the the range of 115 to 127 describes the precision of the measurement. Accuracy says whether or not it's true, but neither of those reflect on the noise. The noise is well just how well can you detect this? Um, so it, it's sort of like saying um, you are throwing dark darts in the dark and you're trying to figure out, well, feeling your board if you actually manage to get everything in the right place. So it's, it's, you're, you're just not quite sure what happened because you can't see it well enough. So what getting above the noise issues. Right. So what is the method then that scientists use to manage their precision, right, well, and their accuracy? What do they do to sort of really, in a way that other scientists will say, yes, we agree, you found the Higgs boson, right? So it, here it's, it's a three-pronged three, three -pronged problem. You have accuracy of your results, and, and that comes from... Uh, basically narrowing a window down and proving nothing's outside of that window. All of the detections we have are within that window. Precision is getting the window smaller and smaller and smaller. And then there's the seeing it above the noise. And the seeing it above the noise, that's the seeing in the dark problem. And, and to get to that, you just have to build more and more sensitive detectors. So in this case, it's things like um, with Atlas, the fiber optics they're using. Um, I actually worked on building this instrument when I was an undergrad. Didn't know at all what I was doing. I was just weaving fibers. I was an undergrad. Really? Yeah. Wow. So it was, I was working on it when I was at Michigan State. And one of the things that we had to do was mix optically perfect epoxy that didn't have any bubbles in it. And every single fiber was checked to make sure that it had the expected light throughput. So if you put a set amount of light in one end, you get the set amount of light out the other end. And any fiber that didn't meet spec got thrown out and we got to redo that entire fiber optics assembly. So with things like Atlas, they, they work very hard to make sure they understand exactly how sensitive the system is and to make it absolutely as sensitive as possible. Basically, the no photon goes unmeasured type of a setup. And, and what about, I guess, same thing with the accuracy, right? Which is that, you know, you need to make sure that every piece of your experiment is performing as, as you expect it to. Right, right. So when, when you say something is at 114 giga electron volts per C squared, you actually mean 114, not 122. When you say 115, you don't actually mean 123. So that, that's where the precision comes in, is making sure you actually, I mean, that's where the accuracy comes in, is you actually know where you are. And the precision is, when I detect it, I'm certain it's where, it, where, where I think it is. And the other big concept that we mentioned at the beginning of the show is reproducibility. So how does right. that come into play with science? This, this is the neutrino faster than light problem where they said, okay, can somebody else in the world reproduce this? Because you never know what is a problem with your system. Um, when they first detected the cosmic microwave background, they blamed their equipment, not the universe. They assumed it was something wrong with their setup, 
pigeon poo, something pigeon poo, in the yeah. horn. Yeah. And and so not only did they do everything they could to make sure that it wasn't noise created by their electronics, but they also went out and they said, okay, can someone else reproduce this? Um, when supernova are detected, the first thing that people do is they put out a call, can someone else confirm this with their detector? And it's by having multiple instruments confirm the same result that you get your first level of confirmation. Now when it comes to ideas that change our understanding of the universe, however, it's not just enough to say this one experiment has been reproduced with this telescope, this telescope, that telescope, or multiple uh, cyclotrons, or the same type of experiment at multiple institutions. You actually have to come up with complementary experiments. So when we say the universe is filled with dark matter, we base that bold statement on the fact that we see things rotating at speeds that can only be explained by there being more stuff out there than, than we can observe. We base it on seeing um, lensing of, dis of distant galaxies, microlensing and macrolensing events of different types. Um, we, we base it on looking at the cosmic microwave background and at the assembly of galaxies. All of these different right. lines of evidence go into dark matter. The same thing with the Big Bang. There's multiple lines of evidence. Right, and eventually we'll be able to have a cup of universe <laughs> and sort it by regular matter and dark energy and dark matter and actually have detected it and know, you know, we also know there's dark matter because we can detect it here in the you know, with our right. instruments. And, and that's the piece of the puzzle that's still being worked on. That's and, kind of like and the next big job. And, and this is, again, where we're starting to see experiments that are making claims that they're detecting a particle. But we don't know if that's really <laughs> above the noise. We don't really know, can you trust that? And so this is where the repeatability comes into the experiments. So then where do you think that people who are like hearing and discovering new theories and hearing them talked about on the internet, you know, either fairly mainstream stuff like the Higgs boson and, uh, you know, other ex you know, dark matter experiments and things like that, but also some of the more interesting theories like the discovery of you know, faster than light neutrinos. I mean, who wouldn't love faster than light travel, right? So, right. you know, a lot of this stuff gets announced. You know, when a lay person hears that kind of stuff, what sort of filter should they use based on what we've been talking about today as a way to sort of put everything in perspective? So anytime you hear an announcement that says that it's going to fundamentally change our understanding of the universe, um, you need to ask, has this been repeated? That should always be your first question is, has this been repeated? And when I say repeated, I mean by somebody else. So when they first announced dark energy back in 1998, what was so amazing is there were two competing teams that didn't particularly like one another because they were competing for financial resources. These two different competing teams both came up with the exact same result using supernovae um, to say our universe isn't behaving the way we thought and it's not behaving the way we thought for both sets of data in the exact same way. Therefore, we have something we're going to call dark energy. Since then, we've been able to add more and more credence to that idea by looking at the cosmic microwave background, by um, looking, again, at models for how large-scale structures formed over time. So the first thing you ask is, has it been proven by more than one experiment? If it's been proven by more than one group of people doing the exact same experiment, it's fair to go, huh, I can start to think that's true. Um, the next thing they should ask is, well, OK, so it was done by more than one place, but how good was the detection? So there, there was, back in 2010, some uh, what looked like for about one month really good evidence for a two sigma detection of the Higgs boson, uh, where both Fermilab and CERN came up with similar results. And then they realized, no, that was the universe, not, not a detection of the Higgs boson, just background noise that always sits there. So then you have multiple experiments, multiple experiments, and then you have high threshold above the noise. So you're certain there's something actually there. Once you know there's something actually there, and it's repeatedly actually there, and then you start saying, OK, so can I find another way to detect the same phenomena? Is there another different type of experiment that somebody else has done? So this is where you get the multiple lines of evidence all proving the same thing. And will scientists typically speak in this sigma oh, yeah. way of describing? Oh, really? 
yeah, we're really lazy. We like to say it's a six sigma result, it's a two sigma result, and uh, so yeah, we're pretty bad about that. Right, but it's like you know, it's like five stars, two stars. Exactly, that's exactly what it is. Right. Six sigma <laughs> is wow. Okay, I can trust this number. Um, but you also have to be careful. So sometimes we lie with numbers. We don't mean to, but we do. So you can have a Six Sigma detection above background of a bright object. Um, but all because you have a Six Sigma detection doesn't mean it is what you think it is. This is where the whole supernova problem comes in. You can have a Six Sigma bright detection on, on your image. And what you've actually detected is something totally different from a supernova. A cosmic ray hit your detector. Uh, airplane flash on your detector, all sorts of different things could have caused a six sigma detection of something radically different than what you claimed it was. And so then, you know, based on that, you know, this sort of reliance on six sigma and, and et cetera, what is a way that you could sort of decide that something is complete and total nonsense, right, just by hearing the vaguest hint of it? You know, what is the, what is the thing that a scientist depends on which a, you know, a pseudoscientist will avoid at all costs? Um, if the person doesn't have error bars on their measurement, they probably don't know how accurate or precise their measurement is. So you need to have error bars. Um, it needs to have, the experiment needs to have been done more than once. And all because something's published doesn't mean it's been done more than once. The research journals are completely filled with experiments that were done once, written up, published, and never repeated again. Or when they were repeated, didn't get results, and therefore the null results that came in the future were never published, because you don't publish null results often. You should. I know you should, but that yeah. doesn't mean people do. Right. Um, so, so you need error bars, and you need repeatability. So if you could like, ask some pseudoscientist, let's see your error bars. Yeah. If, if there are no error bars show up, Okay, so let's say they do. Let's say they do have a working understanding of, of uh, statistics, and they're and uh, you know they're able to provide you some some error bars. So what well, would you want to Well, then you have to next? start actually critiquing their experiment. You have to start saying, okay, did you take into account this? Did you take into account this? Did you take into account this? The right. first, uh, what we thought was a detection of a planet going around a pulsar, turned out to actually be just forgetting to take into account the Doppler shift of the planet Earth. And so you have to be very careful in how you design your experiments. And if someone has what sounds like a phenomenal result, um, you have to make sure they didn't just rediscover a systematic effect that was there and had nothing to do with what they thought it was. And is that the real value of the peer review process is to, you know, look for those error bars, for starters, <laughs> but then to, uh, you know, to hammer on each piece of the experiment or the, you know, to find out what's right and what's you know, perhaps could have introduced some error. At, at the end of the day, none of us remember everything every time. And this is where collaborators help keep you honest. If you have a good collaborator, they're going to go, did you think of? Did you think of? And, and it's a harrowing experience um, if you have a really good collaborator because they will basically beat you up to make sure you thought of everything. But you want a collaborator like that first because they're friendly. Um, and then once you and your collaborators have gone through the did you think of, did you think of, peer review should do the next step of did you think of, did you think of. And only if you can answer yes or answer this is how it would affect it to every one of those did you think of. Peer review should help that happen. And um, that's where good science comes from, is from that dialogue of did you think. That's really cool. All right, well, I think that wraps up this week. Thanks a lot, Pamela. My pleasure. Okay, and here is where we pause our recordings and save, save. and invite you to start asking us <coughs> questions. So apologies while we frantically save in the background. Um, we but had we episodes which have we forgot. never exist, which, which one, or, one or the other of us forgot to save, left it open, and then accidentally... Yeah. Uh, uh, closed the machine or whatever and lost the episode. <coughs> so uh, this was actually episode 250. We're, we're 250. A quarter, it was a, oh. we're a quarter of a way to a thousand episodes. <coughs> well, we have all the question shows and other stuff we've done. I mean, I, I know, but like, 250 yeah. canonical episodes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. All right, cool. All right, so I've, I'm saved. Okay, me so too. So I'll upload. I'll upload later. Um, okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to post a link to the Hangout itself 
into the comment thread. So if anyone is watching right now and has like a question and wants to jump in and ask that question live, then this is the way you can do it. Um, that's, that's our preference. So if you do want to jump into the Hangout, it, our, you know, we much prefer if you've actually got a question for us, then we can do that. Now remember, though, that if you do jump into the Hangout, then everyone's going to see you as well. So just remember that. So, so in the comments, Bob Denny um, writes, yes, the supernovas were misbehaving the same way for both teams, but the why is not yet clear. Dark energy is a placeholder for the real explanation. That's an important point. Now, this, this is actually something that's getting um, harder to talk about as we get more evidence. So dark energy, we don't know exactly what particle or force is responsible for it, but we're able to put it into a smaller and smaller box. We know that dark energy is something that is constant as a function of volume. We know that dark energy is something that's constant as a function of time since the universe formed. Um, we are better and better understanding what dark energy does. So saying it's a placeholder for a real explanation is sort of like saying uh, life is a placeholder for a real explanation. Um, it, saying it's alive is a placeholder for a real explanation. Um, we know Fraser's alive. We hopefully know I'm alive. Um, I can't tell you what it means to be alive or what makes us alive and makes my coffee pot not alive, but we know what life looks like. We know what dark energy looks like. We all voca hate the vocabulary word but it's something that's getting better and better defined with every set of observations we take. So it, it's a real thing. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I know, Bob, I see your comment. I'm just, you're not the only one who thinks these things. And it, it's so easy for people to miss the new data that's coming out because people don't talk about it as much. It's just not as sexy as the original discovery. I have, I have a funny anecdote before we go further, which was last time we were watching Gold Rush, which is like our sort of the show that we like to watch around this house. Think about, you know, drop and just, you know, go and be a gold prospector. I think it'd be fun. Anyway, so I was watching with the kids. <laughs> and we're, we're noting how all of the uh, gold, I was like, yeah, and all the gold is, was created in Supernova. Yeah. And Chloe, you know, my daughter, she went, what? Wait, what? And then asked me a bunch of questions. And then I said, yeah, you know, and all the carbon in your body was made in stars. And, you know, so we all just come from stars. And, it, yeah. and then she then, then sat down and wrote an essay explaining this to her, for her class. It was so funny that she was so excited that, that this was pop, that how, uh, you know, how, how my gold ring came from. That, that she had to like write an essay about it, which I thought That's was quite so cool. Hilarious. Show and tell science. Yeah, no, just that she got that excited about the, yeah. the source of, of all of the heavy atoms in the universe. So Ryan yeah. Burns has joined us. Hi, Ryan. Hi, how are you guys doing? Good. I'm doing well, how are you? What's your question? Um, well, uh, I was going to say a question, but can I just mention something about the uh, star stuff thing yeah. that you were just talking about, Fraser? That's... Um, that's just, uh, I've been a big Carl Sagan fan for a long time, and um, I recently read um, Pale Blue Dot because Pamela um, read a quote from pa Pale Blue Dot, um, I don't know, a hundred episodes or something ago, and it was like, I don't know, like hearing Pamela read Carl Sagan's words was really, I don't know, it was just awesome. I, I loved hearing that, and so I read it and just kind of, I don't know. Anyway, but my question was about the Higgs, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if it's more interesting if the Higgs does not exist, and yes. that we have to... Okay. Can you so, say something about that? Well, so, so the problem that we're running into is currently when we look at the universe, um, we have bosons that are used to communicate the electromagnetic force. So if I want to attach a magnet to a refrigerator, um, I know that there are photons, which is a type of boson, going back and forth, back and forth, communicating that force. Um, there are gluons involved in the hearts of atoms. There, there are particles attached to every force we've identified, except for gravity, which we blame the graviton for. Um, but we can't detect it, which is one of those, ah, really? We can't detect it? And right. then there's this problem of what gives something mass. 
And so the way we've brought all these ideas together is to create the graviton we can't detect and the Higgs boson that if we can't detect it, we're sort of, we don't know what to do with gravity. Gravity is the problem child of physics. Okay. And if we can't find the Higgs boson, that means we're, we're back to um, putting on our thinking caps or involving gravity some more. Okay. There, there's also problems in just trying to, people want to come with a fundamental understanding of why particles do what they do. Right now mm -hmm. we have charts that describe what they do and it's a nice symmetric chart. But there's no physics underlying the chart. It's like Kepler's laws without Newton. Well, right now we have a standard model without underlying physics. Okay. If we can find the Higgs boson, we're on our way to defining the underlying physics. Okay, so I have a question that's like involved in that, and this is probably a really elementary question, but like, is the effect of gravity instant, or is it, does it happen at the speed of light? It happens at the speed of light. Okay. Thank you. Okay. The speed of gravity is the speed of light? Yes, exactly. No, I didn't know if it was an entanglement thing or... No, no, it's, it it's the speed of gravity is the speed of light. So if we lost the sun, it would take us eight minutes before we started to leave orbit. Oh, okay. So we've got two more people joining us. Sorry, Lee, I actually muted you just because there's a lot of background noise going on there. So you can unmute yourself when you, when you ask a question, but right now there's a lot of background noise. So okay, sorry about that. No problem. Yeah, so you just mute yourself and that way we don't get the background. I've got, I hear your television and that kind of thing and it goes into the show, so that's all. Um, and Graham's here. Hey, Graham. Oh, oh, we can't hear you, Graham. You might be muted. Hear me okay now? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, I just removed uh, an, an external mic, which is... Uh, uh, okay, this is more towards about what well, we're talking about precision. Um, Heisenberg uncertainty principle, that merely by measuring something, you'll affect it. Um, right. Do you want to... So, so the ultimate limit, and we, when we talked about the show ahead of time, we planned to get there and then we didn't. Um, so our ultimate ability to measure the posi position of anything is um, limited by how, we, how well we know uh, both its momentum how fast it's moving, essentially, and its position is a function of time. So we can either know exactly where the sucker is located right now, but not where it's going, or we can know where it's going really well and have no clue where it is. So there's this, this interplay between how fast something is going, its velocity, its momentum, and where it is, and our understanding. So. Um, this is where the Heisenberg uncertainty comes in. Now, luckily, we're generally dealing with where's a planet, where's a rock, where's a bird. All of those objects are so big and moving so slowly that the Heisenberg uncertainty principle doesn't start to play in. When we start dealing with particle colliders, it does affect things, but the relativistic corrections we're, we're dealing with um, and so many other systems play in that uh, right now, we're not getting down to precisions where we have to worry about Heisenberg uncertainty principle too much. So, for all the people who are joining us, they're get, I'm, I'm muting everybody. Um, it's nothing personal, but uh, but the we get a lot of background audio. So, if you're listening to the show through your speakers, then then the sound, even though you think you have the noise cancellation on, the sound does actually come back through the speakers and gets into the recording. Um, if you have any background noises going on, so usually if you're going to join us, try to be muted. And then, you know, when you're going to ask your questions or whatever, unmute yourself. But you also want to have headphones on. Both Pamela and I have headphones, although <coughs> chances are our noise cancellation works just fine. It's just sort of just the way to be safe. And so you just want to have that, have the headphones on as you're listening to the show. Don't, if you're going to come into the hangout, don't try and turn on your, your speakers because it's, you get this reverb. And especially if you're, if you're watching the show in another window, then that will, yeah. uh, that will definitely create a reverb. So. Um, so why don't we move on? So did, that, did that answer your question, Graham? Oh, I muted him again. <laughs> Sorry, Graham. Oh, now you need to unmute. I'm not sure if he knows how to do that. All right. Um, Can you shake your head yes or no if we answered your question, Graham? <laughs> right, no, well, uh, we didn't. Okay. <coughs> well, let me. Let's. We've actually got a bunch of people here, so why don't we move on and we'll come back to you, Graham. Um, so, uh, Lee Stevenson has joined us. Hi, Lee. Hi, guys. And How are you doing? Got, 
And we've got Bob Denny, who's joined us. Hey, Bob. And Daniel Berenger has joined us. That's awesome. Wow. Big crap. All right, so Lee, did you have a question for us? Yeah, um, this is something I've been wondering about for quite a while now. If you, is it possible to measure the distances between the galaxies on, uh, for example, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field images and compare those to what we see in our local neighborhood as some sort of proof of the continued expansion of the universe? Yes, uh, we're, we're actually doing that. So with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, one of the things that they do is they map out the positions of all the galaxies and galaxy clusters. And when we start to get to the point that the galaxies are too faint, we start looking strictly at the quasars. So we, we use the quasars as test particles at the greatest distances. And what we find is as we map out the density of galaxies and the way they're distributed on the sky, at greater and greater distances, we find that we currently live in a universe where the galaxies are very much clustered together. It's like living in Swiss cheese with huge holes and only lacy bits of cheese around the holes. But as we work our, our way further and further back in time and we start looking at the universe earlier and earlier, we find the galaxies are much more spread out. It's like cheese that only has small holes in it. And when we get to the cosmic microwave background, it's just this almost solid wall of energy with just fluctuations of parts in a thousand. So we actually are able to map and match to theory how the universe is expanding and forming structures over time. Okay, great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, and so we've got uh, Chris Fluck has also joined us. All right, so I think we're at, uh, we're at Bob. So Bob, do you have a question for us? Oh, okay. Are you talking to me? Yeah, yep. Bob Denny. Bob Denny, yeah. No, I'm just sitting here looking and enjoying and trying to learn, and uh, if I think of one, I'll ask. I'll pop my, my mic on and ask them. Sure, that sounds great. All right, thank you. All right, cool. So, Daniel Berenger, you got you joined us. You got a question for us? Oh, he's muted, too. Uh, you got to unmute your microphone, Daniel. I don't see his lips moving yet, so no? okay. he's still All right. looking. All right, we'll move on. So, Chris... Did you have a question for us? Yeah, hi there, Fraser. Yeah. Uh, it's funny, I was looking at a book a little while ago. It's quite an old book, probably going back to the 70s, one of these kind of classic kind of dusty volumes that you've got on your bookshelf. And it was talking about um, Bode's Nebula. Uh, in fact, a big pardon, not Bode's Nebula, uh, the Andromeda Nebula. And it just kind of occurred to me, you know, we've got all these kind of... Um, all, all this kind of accepted scientific knowledge kind of going back through the, kind of the, the last few kind of decades. Is there anything that you think, either Fraser or, or Pamela, that's accepted at the moment as being accurate scientific knowledge that you think ultimately will be debunked? It, so, for example, with the Andromeda Nebula, it's not a nebula. We know it's a galaxy. We know all about ga galaxies. Is there anything currently on the go at the moment that you think is shortly due to be debunked and will prove to be something completely different to what's currently accepted? Whoa. Oh. See, the, the thing with the Andromeda Nebula was we, we, at that point in time, which was like before my grandparents were born, um, the sky was classified into stars and fuzzy things. And those were pretty much the only two routes we had to go, was star or fuzzy thing. And all fuzzy things were nebula. Um, so right now, we've gotten much better at being able to say when in the universe things are, where in the universe things are. And by putting all those different pieces together, um, I, I think we have a pretty good mapping of what things are in parameter space. And while we probably do get the explanations <coughs> wrong now and then in our early understanding, um, I don't see any more fundamental changes. Um, this could be me by being naive. I just can't think of anything right now that we're going to realize we're completely off the bat about. Maybe some of our gamma ray detections will realize, oh, crud, that wasn't actually what we thought it was. Um, but it's only in those borderline areas of, of high energy astrophysics where we're, we're still doing a lot of guesswork. Um, that, but I can see, oh, sorry, I can, I can see some examples, right, of, of a couple of things. Like one, you had a situation where something was completely unexpected, right, where you had um, uh, like dark energy. So, you know, everyone was talking about whether the universe was expanding or, con you know, going to be steady state, or whether it was going to, you know, have enough gravity or not to, to go any further. And then suddenly, in fact, the expansion of the universe is accelerating, and this was completely unexpected, and it came out of nowhere. And how could you even pr predict that? You know, everyone, yeah. to think, you know, it's not A, B, or C, it's actually D, 
is a just a stunning result, right? But I mean, so, only. So, so I think that was, you know, I think that's the kind of thing. Sorry, I'm just meeting Christopher here. Um, uh, so that that you know, you don't even know how that's going to come from, right? But yeah. then I think of other things like like quasars, right? That the quasars astronomers knew the quasars were around for fifty years, a hundred years ago. Very bright objects didn't really know what they were, and and now we have this very established idea that they're they're actively feeding supermassive black holes. Yeah, hole. the the big difference with the switch to galaxies was there actually had to be major scientific debates over <coughs> is Andromeda separate from the Milky Way galaxy or not. That that there was a huge Harvard debate about that that was a turning point in history. I'm not sure that we still have any questions that we're going to have to have these major debates in order to solve whether it's A or B in our understanding of the universe. I see, you're right, there's going to be lots more pivotal moments where we sort of go, holy, yeah, that baloney was unexpected. Batman. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and expletives but only, will be involved. But, but, only, but, only, sorry. but only, only, only three months ago it would have been ridiculous for someone to have you know, broadcast that they thought it was possible to, ex to exceed the speed of light. And, and here we have people at CERN saying, hold on, we might have something that has exceeded the speed of light. I mean, that is a kind of a fundamental change. I mean, so I mean, if it can happen with the speed of light, I mean, why not something else? Yeah, well, you, you, know, yeah. You, have to be, you have to be open to all of that, and you never know. For sure. But, but, I, but I wonder, like, what's something, like, uh, sorry, I mean, for me, like, like the, I think, for example, and this, you know, I don't really have any real evidence to back this up, which is that when life, you know, if and when life is discovered in the solar system on Mars, you know, there's, you know, bacteria producing methane, that, you know, that will overturn the idea that there's only life on Earth, although, we, you know, we all have an expectation of it. But I also think that, that, there will, you know, there will possibly be a common lineage, you know, through panspermia or, or whatever. And so that'll be kind of, it'll almost feel kind of hollow that when we detect or if we detect life on Mars, that there'll be a common ancestor. And that'll be interesting. See, I don't think that'll be true. So this is right. where, um, I, this, this is where I'm making the differentiation between taking a fundamental understanding we have now and realizing that <laughs> our understanding of what an object is is completely wrong, like happened with Andromeda and just having a, oh, okay, we didn't know the answer, now we do moment. Or, yeah, it's, it's, but we could discuss this the entire day. So I'm going it's to just a wonderful a question, question in Twitter. Yeah, let's, let's, sure, that's an so, awesome question. Though, man. You, <laughs> you killed us. That's a good so one. Thomas Treniker <laughs> in Twitter is asking, is the atmosphere, um, does the atmosphere mess up the spectrogram of a star or is it limited to disturbing its sharpness? We actually, our, our atmosphere is, is a, a major problem when we're doing spectroscopy because it's filled with annoying things like oxygen that absorb out light from the spectra. So when you observe the light of a star and you spread it out into all of its different constituent colors, you'll see both from the star, dark lines in the rainbow that is the light being absorbed out um, by the star's atmosphere. And you'll also see dark places in the rainbow that are due to the Earth's atmosphere absorbing out light. And these oxygen molecular lines are the biggest problem that we have to deal with. So we have both blurring from the atmosphere due to seeing, and we also have the atmosphere just absorbing light because it can, and it does. Um, so these, these are the things we deal with. You know, I've had a few more people join us as well. We've had uh, Professor Michael Zimmerman and... Uh, Christopher Moran. Oh, and someone came in and left. So, uh, did anyone else have a question for us now? Oh, Christopher's got one. Now you got to unmute. Have you unmuted yourself? <laughs> He's unmuting. So go ahead and unmute, and we'll get to you, and then we'll go back to Graham. I can hear. We can definitely hear work? an echo though coming from you. <clears throat> uh, do you still have the screen open that has the show? Oh, yeah, we don't but hear you I have a head headphones on. Okay, we'll go for it and we'll deal yeah. and then mute as soon as you're done with the question. Yeah. Um, I was wondering with the expansion of the universe and everything's moving apart, um, if the spaces in between um, protons and neutrons and all the, the basic particles, are they expanding as well, that space? 
this, this is a really fundamental question. And um, I was the type of nerdy child that when I first heard about the expansion in the universe, I was actually terrified that like my brain was going to get expanded by it to the point that neurons couldn't talk to each other. Um, and this really bothered me when I was a small child. Um, I was a weird kid. Um, but the, the truth is that anything that is chemically held together, so my coffee cup is held together through chemical bonds. Anything that's gravitationally held together, like our planet, our galaxy, the local group that we're, we're within, all of these different bonds, be them chemical or gravitational, are way stronger than the force the system is experiencing from the universe expanding. Mm -hmm. So just like if you drop a floating uh, toy boat into a puddle and add water to the puddle, the puddle will get bigger and bigger and bigger, but the boat will stay the same size floating in that expanding puddle. Well, you, me, the planet, the galaxy, we're all floating in an expanding <coughs> universe and we'll stay the same size while the universe around us expands. And there was a bit of a controversy. You might have heard of a theory called the Big Rip. Yeah. Right? And this was sort of this was one of these fundamental questions that if the accelerate the acceleration of the universe is is increasing, the question is, is the um, is more energy being created in smaller and smaller spaces? Is the amount of energy in every square, you know, meter of the universe cubic. increasing? We're three cubic. Yeah, every, yeah, sorry, every cubic meter. And if it is, then you've got this possibility of the big rip, where as more and more energy happens, there's a more expansive <coughs> force that eventually starts to tear apart solar systems and eventually starts to tear apart stars and eventually starts to tear apart atoms themselves. But the latest evidence seems to be that the amount, the total amount of energy that's coming into the universe in every cubic meter is the same. And so yeah, it's, the it's big near as is we, not going to happen. It, as near as we can tell, the energy of dark energy is just the same amount of energy as a couple of protons per cubic meter. So take a hydrogen atom, strip it naked, drop a couple of them in each cubic meter of space, and that's the total energy engaged in dark energy. There you go. Cool. So, other um, questions? Out did there? anyone else have a question? Just put your hand up. Graham <laughs> had one. Go ahead, Graham. <coughs> no, you're still muted, I think. We can't hear you, I'm sorry. Can you type the question and then we'll read it out loud? I'm sorry, Graham. I don't know where the technology suddenly failed. The mute button should be up in the upper right-hand corner of your, uh, of the hangout. But. Oh, wait. He, he blacked himself out. There we hello? go. Hello? Oh, hello? Now we can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yep. yep. Okay, it was a, it was a follow-up question about the problems they were having at CERN. Uh, could there have been a Heisenberg uh, uncertainty issue about uh, the uh, measurements causing the anomaly to occur? This this was the uh, faster than light travel for the neutrino? Yeah, I was just wondering if it's a Heisenberg issue. But that that not. wouldn't be a Heisenberg issue. We actually think it's probably some sort of an issue with either not understanding um, the timing so uh, when you're trying to sync clocks between two different locations, there's a whole lot of relativity you have to take into consideration. So there's either a problem in their understanding the separations between the two places, a problem with something as, as stupidly fundamental as um, the different parts of the planet are spreading apart from one another, um, or moving together. Yeah. This would be the case of moving together. So it's something that either affects the they didn't sync up the two clocks correctly, or they didn't know the distance the particles they were did. traveling correctly. Well, they did. Well, they so claim they did, but pretty much everyone is in agreement that there's those are the probably the two places the two mm -hmm. two mistakes happened. Yeah, yeah and it's and it's such a enormous result. It's such a yeah. mind changing result that the onus is on everybody to try and get to the bottom of it and try to reproduce the experiment, which is what we talked about today. Yeah, and even the researchers when they came out with their press release, it wasn't a neutrinos travel faster than the speed of light. It was a, oh, we got this weird thing. Can anyone reproduce it? We're not quite sure about this. Help. Um, so there's a difference yeah. in tone between the two different results. One being, we solved it, and the other one being, ah, help. And this was much more of the help type of a, a press release. Yeah. Okay, so that doesn't solve the problem, does it? Okay. No, no. It's fair. <laughs> um, 
All right, so did anyone else have a question for us? I'm going to pull one from the chat. Okay. Because we're giving all the love to the uh, <coughs> to the people here and with us. Um, so there's a question, what type of telescope is SOHO? It is, uh, actually, SOHO is a satellite, and so it has a whole bunch of different instruments on it that all do different things. They have a really good website, and as always, Wikipedia usually has everything easier to find. So, so Josh uh, Andrews asks, would the South Pole be a good place for sky gazing, and has anyone tried it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's observatories <coughs> down there. So the beautiful thing about working at the South Pole is, um, well, actually, many things. It's mm -hmm. extremely dry, so there's annoying oxygen um, water vapor lines that you get other places. Not so much of a problem. Um, it has either many, many day-long days with the sun up, so you can do great helio observing, or it has extremely long nights, so you can do extremely long nighttime observations. So there's a number of different observatories built down there um, to observe the sun, the stars, and actually alternate wavelengths where people are <laughs> building infrared facilities and other facilities down there. Yeah. Um, it's a great place to go if you don't mind being isolated. Yeah, the South Pole is, and there's a place, there's a, there's a plateau in this, you know, at the South Pole that's widely considered the best place for yeah. observing on the entire Earth. It is high altitude, dry, cold, no atmospheric disturbance. Is, as Pamela said, you get these big long nights. It is absolutely the best place to go in the whole world. It's the equivalent of like being able to put a space telescope on the surface of the Earth, except that it's at the South Pole. Yeah. which is a really awful place to try and go and do astronomy. So, um, so yeah, so that's, that's one of the, absolutely one of the greatest places to, to set up a telescope. And there are lots of, of telescopes set up there right now. And the number two place is the Atacama Desert. Uh, unfortunately, northern hemisphere, not so friendly to observing. Yeah. And, but, the, but the North Pole would be good, except it's water. Right. All right, so did anyone else in the, in the uh, hangout have a question for us? Put your hand up if you got something. <clears throat> oh, there we go. All right, so R R. Uh, yes, it's Ryan. Hi, <laughs> Ryan. <laughs> uh, yes. Um. By the way, pleasure talking to both of you. I've been a huge fan for a long time. Um. I I just have one quick question, and I just wanted to know if either one of you will be in Florida anytime in the near future. Well, by definition, we're going to be there in December to leave on our, our cruise. So we'll both be in Miami um, to leave on our The World Is Not Ending cruise. I don't know if we'll make it down beforehand. It would be great to make it for a launch of some sort, but yeah. it's, it's not currently planned. So that's we'll the, that's the only year. thing is that we both go down there from time to time for launches out at uh, Cape Canaveral. So right. I was there twice in Florida last year, and so, but we never know. All right. Thank you. So Yorga is asking in the Google Plus questions, if a light year is the distance light travels in vacuum in roughly a year, how does that work out if you get closer to the speed of light? Time would change relati relatively to other things. How does that work out in the end? Well, the thing is, um, because of the way time changes, no matter how fast you are going, you observe light traveling one light year's distance in one year of your time. So your time will change so that you always see light travel the same distance in that amount of time. It's one of those really confusing things. So the faster you go, the slower your watch ticks so that light always makes it the same distance per tick. It's just the ticks are variable. It's, it's, it's crazy, but light always appears to be moving the same speed and will go the same distance in an observer's same amount of time. Thanks, Einstein. <laughs> okay, so we, we had a hand raised by yep. Professor Zimmerman. Go ahead. Yeah, hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, I'm Michael. I'm from Germany, and uh, I'm uh, not a natural scientist. But I have a, a general question. Um, the uh, European Space Organization is uh, building a very large telescope uh, in addition to the already existing, the array they have there, I think there's four telescopes already. Yeah. Uh, now, when they finish this, they claim that it will be 15 times or better uh, than Hubble. Yes. 
Now, what will they actually uh, be doing with this? Will they go uh, uh, doing more research uh, with regard to the beginning of everything, in, uh, like this, the Big Bang, or uh, will they do other things? They will, they're going to be doing a whole bunch of different stuff. This, this is. I don't remember if they finally settled on uh, extremely large telescope or overwhelmingly. Yes. It's extremely large. Okay, so this is the extremely large telescope. Um, they're in the process of casting the mirrors for it right now. Yes. Um, they're, I think, 27 feet across per mirror. Yes, um, that's right. And Something and like it's it's going to be huge. And the idea of this system is by building a telescope that's extraordinarily large, they'll be able to detect both extremely faint things. So um, small galaxies forming at the beginning of the universe are very faint. Um, but they'll also be able to make out um, very high, very um, small objects because they're going to use uh, adaptive optics to allow them to get extremely high resolution. Our atmosphere generally makes it impossible to get very high resolution images unless you flex the mirror to compensate for the constantly moving atmosphere. And this telescope is combining all the pieces to get those faint objects and, the, and get the resolution needed to resolve them. Now, you can also use the same sort of thing to start making out um, stars in the process of forming planetary systems forming around stars. Uh, there's all sorts of different science. In, in astronomy, we build two instruments, two different families of instruments. There's single purpose things like the Wilkinson anisotropy probe, which measured the cosmomicrave background. Single purpose dedicated mission. We also build things like the Hubble, the very large telescope, and now this one, that are built with general goals, understanding galaxies forming at the beginning of the universe. But then we realize, wow, we can do all these other amazing things with them as well. And so it's like that hammer that you bought to put the one picture in the wall, and then you realize you can use it to do a whole multitude of different things. Yeah. You yeah, I mean, they're using the cobble for things they had no idea they were oh, using yeah. them for, right? That's right. You earlier mentioned uh, or talked about the expansion of the universe. And uh, now, uh, my question is this, if the, uh, the local group is basically sticking together by gravitational forces and all the, all the rest of the universe is expanding to the point that, let's uh, uh, use the, the, let's exaggerate that a little bit. Uh, now, if everything goes away, will this group still be linked together and yes. we can see Andromeda, the local group, or uh, will it all eventually dissipate? So the future that we're looking at is the local group is in the process of falling into the local supercluster. Yeah. And in the far distant future, the entirety of our sky is going to be the members of that supercluster. And everything beyond that supercluster is going to have been gravitationally carried away, by, or sorry, is going to be expansionally carried away, such that it's beyond our, our visible horizon. Yes. So while what we're tied to, our local group and the supercluster we're falling into, will still be visible. Everything else will be carried out of our field of view. Yeah, and I guess well, in the far, far future, it's all going to come together into one elliptical galaxy. Well, it, we, we still haven't worked out all the kinematics of that. It, it, <laughs> it could be that we simply are a bunch of dead stars that still form separate groups within a supercluster. So, ba so basically what you're saying is if, if everything moves apart, uh, then eventually there will be nothing. In the, at least we would see not much in the sky except for our local group. Uh, it and will become islands. It will become an island, yes. But the rest of the universe is moving further and further apart. And I just recently read a, a, a paper uh, where it uh, said that Actually, what the universe is, seems to be doing, or what seems to be happening, is it's making room for another Big Bang to create another universe. Yeah, that's just a theory. A we have no way of proving or disproving <laughs> that one. Yeah. People can make stuff up, but uh, yeah, that falls into the neither provable nor disprovable and no reason to believe it category. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so David Bidix 
sorry if I destroyed your name, uh, is asking in the Hangout, um, questions from North Carolina. My daughter is studying the sun in sixth grade science class right now, and she would like to know um, that with the increase in solar activity currently are underway, are there any health effects we experience on Earth when major s solar storms like the one unleashed last week come our way? No. We, we are healthy-wise as long as we're not on the International Space Station. Anyone on the surface of the Earth, we're completely <coughs> safe. Um, the sun's uh, solar storms are creating amazing light shows for people in the north, uh, northern latitudes and the southern latitudes. But all of that, it's just affecting our atmosphere. And that atmosphere that's creating the fabulous light show is protecting us from all that radiation. So you're fine. Just enjoy the show. <laughs> well, what's the absolute worst that could happen? I mean, just technology fail, right? Yeah, yeah. No, we do need to worry about satellite destruction. We do need to worry about extra radiation experienced by the, by the astronauts. Um, the, the force of, of this extra material from the sun hitting our magnetic field actually pushed the magnetic field in such that geosynchronous satellites, which normally are, are inside the, the magnetosphere of the Earth, uh, that magnetosphere came inside and so all of those geosynchronous satellites are exposed to way more radiation than they're used to. But they're far, far away. Down here, we're safe. International Space Station, they're, they're much, much closer to the Earth. Um, they'll experience minor levels of increased radiation, but nothing to be worried about. So we're at about an hour and ten minutes or so right now, Pamela. How's your time? Okay. Um, at some point, I need to stop ignoring my inbox. Yeah, me too. <laughs> but, but why don't we take a couple more questions and then we'll, and okay. we'll move on. So I think someone in the Hangout had their hand up before. There we go. Yeah, go ahead. Hi. Um, forgive me. Um, I'm a little new to this format. Um, You're fine. But we all are. <laughs> um, <laughs> my, my concern has to deal with... Um, you know, where we stand is, I'm American, obviously, and where we stand as far as uh, the space program goes. Um, I'm, I'm very concerned on a number of fronts about our space program. I don't feel that it's been getting the attention that it needs. And one of the biggest questions that comes to my mind, you know, my dad talks about all the, the, the space missions that went on in the 60s and so forth. And, you know, he was always telling me, well, by, you know, he thought by my time, you know, we'd be seeing all kinds of, of neat things going on. And my question is, why haven't we not been back to the moon? What is your theory behind that? Why aren't we pushing this further? We beat the Soviets. I, it, it, it comes down to the basic, what is the political push for us to go do this? Um, back during the Apollo age, we were trying to prove that we were the dominant force. And the U.S. government was willing to spend more than 4% of the total U.S. budget on the space race to get us to the moon, uh, to plant our flag and say, huh, see that? We're here first. Um, we made it. We did it. Mission solved. And spending that much money just to do science is something that the U.S. government struggles to do. Uh, it's easy to spend that much money on things that will get voters. So the amount of money spent on the U.S. stimulus package last year was greater than the entirety of the budget ever spent on NASA. So take one year's stimulus spending, take all several decades of NASA funding, that one stimulus bundle was a greater amount of money. And that stimulus spending got votes. Spending money on NASA is the type of thing that people go, why are you spending money on NASA when you could be spending it on schools, ro roads, health care? And until there's right. a political reason, NASA's not going to pay for it. NASA's only going to be able to pay for the fundamental research that isn't going to get done any other way. Now, we do have the commercial right. space agencies. We do have the Google X Prize. There, there's... A, a pot of money to whoever gets to the moon first, roves a set distance, and sends the information back to the planet Earth. And I think that instead of turning to NASA, we need to be turning to SpaceX. We need to be turning to Virgin Galactic, and we need to be helping encourage them to make space commercially viable so that we have other options when the U.S. 
taxpayer doesn't support science anymore. And that's what it comes to at the end of the day is your average voter isn't going to vote to spend money on science. And remember that this is an international podcast, right? I'm in Canada. Yeah. Pamela's in the States. <clears throat> we have listeners in Germany and, and all around the world. And so, you know, there's some really interesting uh, progress that's happening from the Chinese. And, yeah. you know, they're, they're dead set on... on building space stations and getting people probably to the moon. And you might find that if some of that technology gets worked out, then maybe they'll sell it to, to other people for, you know, at a, at a cut rate, just like we can buy iPhones. Uh, there's a lot of really, as, as Pamela said, really interesting private space that's, yeah. that's going. Um, so I think that, that I'm actually really hopeful. And I think part of the problem is that we, we put all of our hopes and dreams in one agency and say, you know, it's NASA's job, so no one else needs to think about it. And, and now we're at the point where, where people are finally saying, okay, you know what, NASA can't do all of it themselves. Let's come up with alternative ways, which are now very redundant. And so now there's, you know, just in case, you know, if the Google X Prize doesn't work out, what SpaceX is doing could work out and what the Google Lunar X Prize could, is doing could work out. So there's all these different ways now that people are moving forward, and I think that's really exciting. So I'm more hopeful now about human space exploration than I think at any point because I feel like the, the veneer is finally lifted and we're seeing the reality of it, which is that there needs to be you know, various reasons to various people why we need to go to space, not just some political, it's all based on some political will. We're, we're almost to the age of the barnstormers. Yeah, and that's when it gets exciting. Yeah. So don't worry. Uh, one, one more quick comment on that. Um, if, if the only reason to get to the moon was to beat the Russians, then why would these other countries also be wanting to get to the moon? I mean, obviously... To thump their chests, too. I mean, well, it, it still applies. But, I mean, but obviously there's a lot more things that, that come out of doing things like that, you know, than just politically. I mean, look at the technology that comes from the space program, uh, microwaves, uh, magnetic resonance imagery, uh, Velcro, uh, you know, all these different types of things that contribute to our economy. Um, I heard a statistic uh, that was quoted saying, like, for every dollar that's put in the space program, it returns something like 10 back into the economy. So I would think that if we at least had somebody to be able to communicate these benefits better, then maybe we could sell voters on that more effectively. It, the, the problem that we're dealing with in the United States is, and, and John Stewart on The Daily Show hits on this on a regular basis, is the average person in America right now is distrustful of science, thinks that um, scientists are people who are basically lying in order to get money to do what they want to do. And um, that scientific theory, one of the side effects of our current multiculturalism is that scientific theories are placed on equal footing with religious theories as just your culture. And so there's a lot of educational issues in terms of teaching people what really is science, what does it mean, what is the peer review system. A lot of those things have to take place before what we communicate gets listened to. As long as scientists are viewed as crazy people doing things that no one cares about, that waste money, um, we're not going to be able to change voters. But the anti-vax movement is a huge proof. Yeah. yeah. So I think at that point, I think we should probably uh, wrap it up. So thanks again to everybody who is watching. Thanks to Pamela, as always, for, uh, for taking the time to to explain it all to all of us. Now it's great. I get to just kick back and you guys get to ask the questions. I think this is amazing. Uh, so, and, and thanks again to Google Plus for giving us this infrastructure. If you haven't already, please plus one the, the, uh, the link to this, uh, to this post so that we can know sort of how many people are watching it. And, uh, and then otherwise, the, the next thing that we're going to be doing is remember on Thursday, 10 a.m. Pacific, I'll let you calculate the time zones. Uh, we do our <laughs> weekly space hangout, and that's going to be with me and Pamela and Phil Plate and some combination of Emily Lakdawalla and Helen Boyle and Ian O'Neill. So it's a pretty great crew. And we'll and round we up all of the space news. 10 a.m. Pacific, uh, 1 Eastern, 6 GMT, <laughs> uh, what, uh So So we announce all of the times in yes. all of the different time zones. 
uh, in a blog post every week. So if you follow the CosmoQuest blog, cosmoquest.org slash blog, uh, every Friday I put up a post that has all of that week's activities, all of the time zones, US, London, Sydney. Um, and then the other thing we're going to do is we try to do at least one virtual star party a week. And that's where we connect up uh, one or many telescopes into a hangout and try to look at different objects and talk about what we're seeing and take photographs and create a scrapbook at the end of it. And it's a really cool experience. In fact, I know that Gary is watching right now. So uh, and Gary's the superstar that had this 14-inch telescope uh, last week. So hopefully Gary will let me know when he's free this week. And if he's got good seeing, we'll try another, take another crack at it. So if you haven't, it's a pretty cool experience. So that's what's coming up this week. And, uh, and thanks again for, uh, for watching and being patient with us as we figure all this out. And we'll talk to you guys uh, after. We'll talk to you next time. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks bye -bye. for joining us. Bye-bye. Thanks, Pam. Bye-bye.